And ladies and gentlemen, welcome to albertastand.ca podcast. I'm your host, Richard Gordon. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about safe consumption sites. And with me, I have a uh, concerned citizen and super activist, Kim Siever from Lethbridge. Um, Kim has written a blog uh, this week on Twitter that caught my attention in regards to what the, what's been happening with the UCP government and safe consumption sites. So today, I'd like to welcome to the show, Kim Siever. Kim, how the hell are you, buddy? I'm great. Thanks for having me on. That's it's good. an honor to be here. Awesome. Excellent. So what I was wondering was uh, if we could just basically have a, sort of a short synopsis. So on the 21st, you wrote a pretty good uh, rebuttal to uh, some comments regarding the closing of safe consumption sites and how it somehow magically leads to a healthier community. So can you just talk a little bit about what sort of the uh, impetus was for your response to that? Yeah, so I've actually, it actually goes back to this past summer. Um, I'm not even sure what it was that initiated it, but I created a Facebook post that just sort of outlined um, some of the common myths that I've been hearing about the supervised consumption site and uh, just offered some rebuttals for each one of those myths. I think there were nine of them. And it sort of went viral. I was actually quite surprised. I, 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 was, uh, I personally. <laughs> what's that? I was super excited personally. Yeah. To see something like that get some attention, right? And get some some actual like uh, traction out there with people. Sure. And then, um, yeah, like I had, I think I had close to fifty thousand views or something on it. I can't even remember now. Um, but it showed me that there was a lot of desire for information out there. And so I just started building on that. I started creating content specific to supervised consumption sites. I created some um, graphics related to those nine myths. I created a blog post, I created a video all based on that same information. And I started to repurpose. I already had a Facebook page that I was using for my poetry. And um, I had a blog that I was using for my poetry and I sort of repurposed those to, um, for, as a vehicle or as vehicles for getting out information about supervised consumption site and leftist politics in general. Okay. Um, and then just the, the content I built after that ended up almost always being in response to something else I've seen. So it might have been uh, comments by a city councilor and a city council meeting. It might have been a letter to letter to the editor. Um, it might have been a video of a presentation from somebody or that sort of thing. So whenever I've seen that, I've created a response post to those things. Uh, I also did a I sent uh, a letter off to um, there's a panel interviewing people, the general public about supervised consumption science and getting feedback and so I sent off an email to that and I published the content of that email as a blog post as well and so really the the content that I shared on Twitter this past week was in line with all of that there this past month there have been three letters to the editor to the Lethbridge Herald which is the main newspaper here in Lethbridge yeah the main daily newspaper and there was also, they have a weekly feature in their paper every Monday. They have something called roast and toast, where you can just write in anonymously toast somebody or something or roast somebody or something. And there were at least half a dozen roasts regarding the supervised consumption site. And so yeah. I did a blog post um, addressing each one of those. And then I did three blog posts this week, responding to those three letters to the editor. And the tweet thread that you're referring to was probably one of those blog posts exactly so well basically you know the reason why I, I think you're on well why i picked you to come on my show is because uh you're just a single individual you set up uh like you have a bit of a website where you try to do a lot of the the uh advocate or do some advocacy for some of the things that uh you care really deeply about so obviously 
you know, this opiate problem that we're experiencing in the province, it's, it's never been this bad. And it seems to be affecting those communities in Southern Alberta disproportionately to the rest of the province. And I don't necessarily know why I'm not going to oh, talk to that. Why. Please. Yeah, please do. I mean, like it, again, this is all for our own edification, just trying to, to, to find out exactly Sort sure, of so the, the main story. reason is that we don't have treatment services here, not in any real substantial way. We have a little bit, but nothing to deal with the, the problem we have here. And as a result, people's addictions aren't being treated. Right. right. And so that's why it's so huge. In Calgary and Edmonton, even though they have significant problems there, they have lots of treatment services available, lots of treatment spaces available. And so they're able to have less of an issue because they can treat some of that. We can't. Okay. So that's really our biggest problem here. And people seeing this automatically blame the supervised consumption site when in reality, the problem is, or I sh one of the problems is lack of treatment services available here in Lethbridge. So despite the fact that our city council has been petitioning the, gov the provincial government for a long time for treatment service and we haven't received anything. Yeah, and and now it just seems that their their mo is to make it even more difficult. So can you kind of take us through sort of what the UCP government's uh, <clears throat> sort of tact has been on this particular issue? Is it just a matter of if we ignore it, you know, hopefully these guys will just go away in time? Like, well, I. I'm actually not quite sure. All that we've seen so far is that there's been a panel that was established months ago and they still haven't released the report. They stopped collecting data a long time ago, weeks ago. Um, so I'm not sure how long it takes to compile that information. Um, the only other thing is that they have provide, they have promised um, a certain amount of money for uh, treatment services. I can't recall how much, how much it is, but um, then they did a, announcement earlier in February. Uh, I can't remember how much it was. Oh yeah, so last September they announced that they were gonna have 4,000, funding for 4,000 addictions treatment spaces, which isn't gonna be anywhere near enough. Um, but of the ones, my understanding is of the ones that have been announced so far, it's all gone to um, abstinence-based programs. So you, my understanding of it is that in order to access those treatment services, you already have to be abstaining from drugs, which is problematic, right? Yeah, it because is. Somehow you have to get off your addiction before you go into the abstinence-based program. And so, you know, basically this is like typical conservative bootstrap uh, mentality. Like you... Before we're going to give you a hand, you have to do most of the heavy lifting, right? Well, we know that that's pretty much impossible for a lot of people who are trapped in those addictions. So, you know, um, also, correct me if I'm wrong, but uh, is it, like, are, are we having a lot of the funding going towards um, specific types of groups for this abstinence-based? Uh, so what I, have, what I have been able to determine this far, but I haven't been able to find any concrete proof, but it seems to be that the organizations who are receiving the funding up to this point are religious-based institutions. Okay. Um, but their websites are pretty quiet on that aspect. They kind of tone down the religious rhetoric on their website, so it's really difficult on the surface to be able to see that, but on based on the things I've been able to determine from talking to other people, this is what seems to be the case. So I guess that, you know, we kind of laid it out like sort of where the, where the major issues are uh, in terms of uh, not being not much support and not much help for, for addicts down there. Uh, is there anything else you kind of wanted to add, like that you think is, you know, detrimental to this particular conversation? Like, 
I mean, obviously we need to keep talking about it. That's one of the reasons why I invited you on the show today was to kind of get this out of here, out here. But um, it seems to me that there, there's a lot of sympathy for people in these particular situations. And I'm just kind of, I guess, what would you like to see in terms of, uh, of res- uh, an income? Like, are we having the right dialogue with anybody in government over this issue? Are we seeing any like uh, willingness by the government to 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 work and understand on this or have they just taken a pretty serious hard line that uh safe consumption sites just don't work and they're going to put their fingers in their ears and just ignore all the evidence i don't think there's been anything concrete communicated by the current government or at least the ucp side of the government because the government's more than just ucp um i don't think there's anything concrete that's been communicated at least to Lethbridge that they are going to protect the supervised consumption site. I, based on the things I've read, it seems as if they are keeping it open to shutting it down, keeping the option open to shutting it down. Um, I don't, I don't want to see that. I think that we still need a supervised consumption site. Never mind the fact that they do, they provide 16 other services other than supervised consumption. But that needs to be part of the solution. We also need treatment services. And I think that is one of the things that is sorely lacking in the rhetoric around the supervised consumption site, is there are far too many people complaining about the supervised consumption site and insisting that it be shut down, and far few people asking for more treatment services. I think the amount of energy that is being spent into trying to get the supervised consumption site down, complaining on social media in the comment sections about the supervised consumption site, tying crime to the supervised consumption site, that energy could be spent in petitioning the provincial government for for funding for treatment services. And it's not be done because everybody would rather focus on a scapegoat than focus on real solutions that could actually make a difference. Yeah, and I mean we've seen we've seen this uh, uh, rhetoric and uh, doctrine before from them. Uh, you know, they, it seems to me that they just keep choosing this social conservative ideology over logic and facts at almost every turn. So um, I just wanted to thank you for for a lot of that and <clears throat> and uh, for being an advocate in the online community here in Alberta. I think it's really important that we give a voice to that. Uh, especially for the amount of pain that it's causing everyday Albertans and and the cost it is to families. One other thing I wanted to talk about that I thought was really interesting and super got my attention was um, this list that you came up with and published on Twitter of all of the uh, sort of peripheral staff in the uh, – government uh, or in Kenny's office. So if to anybody who doesn't necessarily know what I'm talking about um, later, I think last week, Kim, you were able to do some research. You did some digging and found the contract amounts for some of the um, executive assistants, speech writers, caucus affairs people, um, and really kind of laid out a list of uh, how much, you know, pretty much what, their annual salaries are and that in an attempt to sort of draw attention to this whole hypocrisy around reducing red tape and uh, administration costs in this particular government. So can you kind of just sort of take us through uh, the steps, like sort of what got you thinking about this? How did you go about finding these numbers and putting it together? Again, this was just like another uh, tweet that just sort of, caught on fire and it, sort of, it did yeah sort of went with it, it and I think a lot of people a lot of people really appreciated uh the work that you did and went into that if you could talk about that it'd be great sure yeah so I um I it was last Monday was when I um was when I did the tweet and I don't recall exactly what it was that prompted me to put that data together, but I think I saw something somebody else had said that sort of gave me the idea of putting it together. And um, yeah, it did, it was quite popular. Um, it, it received 547 retweets 
734 likes. I uh, got 183 comments on it. And it's seen by, by over now, almost 91.17.6% uh, and a total number of engagements of over 16,000. So that's retweets, comments, clicks. Yeah, people looking at it, just reading it. Yeah. So it, it was my most popular tweet by far, I believe. Uh, no, no, sorry. No, that's not true. I did have one more that was more popular last May. So this is my second most popular tweet that I've ever put out. And so, um, and so, so how yeah. You actually, it, sorry to interrupt. Just how did you go about putting the data? Yeah, so that, that's what I was just about to say. So um, to, to tell what you had said earlier, so what I did um, is they don't have this information laid out pretty easily. Um, and so I had, to, but what they did have is they have all the contracts of all the, um, the, their sunshine list, basically. It's not called sunshine list, but you have to go through it. They have the contracts for all the people who make a hundred thousand dollars or more. A year, all of them. Yeah. All of those people in all the public departments, ministries, the premier's office. And so I just went through all of the, all the contracts for all the minister, the prime minister, the premier's office. Sorry. Um, and I just browsed through each one of the contracts, found their, their it's actually their bi-weekly salary. I poured that all into a spreadsheet and I obviously times it by 26 to get the annual salary and then divided that by 12 to get the monthly salary and then took out the names and then, yeah, copied it or did a screenshot and posted it onto Twitter. Well, we see in comparison to like, I mean, I don't know if you had a chance to look at that numbers, but in comparison to the, to the NDP's uh, yep. size of their administration, do we know like how this ranks in comparison to this? Is this? Yeah, I totally do. So yeah, so they actually, so they had a total annual salary, the, the amount that they would put out, the UCP, every to put out haven't been in for a full year yet and these contracts are i believe starting this past september so nearly three million dollars three two hundred fifty eight thousand six hundred fourteen dollars and 30 is how much in salaries for all of these people 19 people the ndp so that was nearly three million the ndp was paying out Two million one hundred thirty-seven thousand five hundred three dollars forty-two cents for twenty staff, but that includes people, all of Notley's staff, no matter how much they made. Everybody, hundred thousand and under hundred thousand. She had nine staff members who were making under a hundred thousand dollars a year, and uh, and then a couple who just barely over hundred thousand. Yeah, nine, nine, nine staff. So she basically, um, she was paying, we were paying out less for more staff than what we're paying out to Jason Kennedy. So we were paying out less for her 19 or her 20, that's entire staff, than Jason Kenny is paying out for his 19 most expensive staff. Yeah. yeah. And on a population basis, so I compare this to the population, 52 cents per capita, uh, for 52 cents. For Jason Kenney, we're paying 68 cents per capita. So we're paying 20% more under Jason Kenney for 19 people than we were for um, Notley under 20 people. And get this, Ontario, they have only four more people on their sunshine list than Jason Kenney does. He has 19, they have 24, or five more people, sorry. He has 19, they have 24. And we're paying twice as much per capita than they are. Yeah, that's just insane. And, and, and so has there been any offered reasoning for this? I mean, yeah, the only know, thing they say, like, go ahead. The only thing they're saying is that, uh, and these are mostly supporters. They're saying that, um, well, you get what you pay for. This is higher quality. We had to clean up under the, um, all the mess that Notley left behind. And when you press them on it, they have nothing. It's like, well, what, what mess are you referring to? What skills do these specific positions have? that weren't available under Notley. How much more qualified are these individuals more than Notley's staff? And they have nothing to provide. I actually had um, Matt, uh, oh, what's his name? The uh, issues management person for- Matt Wolf. 
Wolf, that's it. I actually had Matt Wolf respond and he, he responded with a link to a news article that was quoting him <laughs> stating that they were spending less for all of the staff for the premier's office and the ministries than we're spending under the NDP. But I'm, I'm, and that was, but that's their first year to the NDP's last year. And there's no data for when you ask them for the data, they don't provide it. No. And when I, um, I forgot my train of thought. That's all right. Um, yeah, when I compared Notley's staff to Kenny's staff, it's for first year to first year because I thought that was the fairest way. Because of Kenny's Kenny's spending is probably going to go up in the next three years, right? And Notley's spending probably went up as well. So she probably spent more her final year for her staff than in the first year because there were probably raises, there might have been more staff, that sort of thing. So I thought it was fair to do first year to first year. Right. Um, but yeah, so... So yeah, he quoted me. And then when I pressed him on it, he didn't respond. That's the first time that Matt Wolf has ever responded to anything I posted. And I, I tag Jason Kenny and my stuff every day. Yeah. So, you know, like I, this is typical of what I sort of talk about on the show a lot. And that is that, you know, a lot of this is them trying to generate a specific narrative. Right. And uh, individuals such as Matt Wolf, without going too far into the rabbit hole on that transplant from Ontario, but you know, like his job primarily is is setting up these narratives and and trying to spin things in a way that makes it look like things aren't necessarily their fault. And we see this time and time again. Um, I think almost every interaction I've ever had with Matt Wolf online has been completely disingenuous and his high ground generally tends to be a giant pile of shit yeah and so anyway yeah, every, everything is the ndp's fault or the liberals fault that's right and there doesn't seem to be much in the way of accountability for for any of this stuff and it seems to me that in a lot of ways like especially uh like i know this week we haven't really touched on it too much but talking about the cancellation of the Alberta Medical Association contract, mm. um, all the disingenuous uh, dialogue that's been going on online back and forth. I mean, we really are kind of at war with this consultant class in the province, these guys that are sort of in the business of staying in business. Thanks a lot for coming on the show today, Kim. Um, I really appreciate it. You yourself, you have a website. Uh, I would like to draw some attention to that. If you wouldn't mind telling us that's Kim.Siever, S-I-E-V-E-R slash. No, it's Siever.ca slash Kim. Okay. So that's, I'll let it that out. Uh, <laughs> that's good. I'd like to see some, some more uh, stuff come your way. You write a blog approximately once a week and you're pretty heavily involved in uh, some of these issues and advocacy. Uh, at the moment I'm writing at least two blog posts a week. Well, that's good. Um, I'm going to plug it. I'm going to keep uh, an eye on you and hopefully I could talk to you next week. If you have anything you ever want to talk about, or if anybody has anything they ever want to talk to us about here at albertastand.ca, please send us an email at what's your deal at albertastand.ca. Visit the show and the podcast at www.albertastand.ca. Kim, thanks a lot so much for, for your time today. I really appreciate it. I know we had a uh, couple of hiccups trying to get the tech worked out. but uh, And I'd also like to uh, personally thank Markham Hislop from Energy Media for kind of getting me out of the mud on that. Uh, Kim, I look forward to talking to you again. Thank you so much for your time and uh, have yourself a great day. Yeah, my, my pleasure. I um, sincerely appreciate you having me on. Excellent. Well, we will again. I guarantee you we're going to do more of this stuff and we're just going to, going to try to take it and do what we can and rebuttal uh, this craziness one issue at a time. So again, yeah, just want to thank you again. <laughs> I can't thank you enough, apparently. Um, and yeah, have yourself a really great week. Um, that's about it. Uh, you too. Yeah. Solidarity. Yeah, man, for sure. <laughs>